You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to Heritage Voices, episode 26. I'm Jessica Uquinto, and I'll be your host today. And today we are talking about archaeology outreach in local Maya communities in the Yucatan. Before we begin, I'd like to honor and acknowledge the Nuch, or Ute peoples, on whose treaty lands I'm recording today, as well as the fact that this area is also part of the Dineta and the ancestral Puebloan homeland. So today I have Dr. Adolfo Ivan Batun Alpuche and Dr. Kristen Landry Montes calling in from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Dr. Batun received his bachelor's from the Universidad Autónoma de Yucatán and his master's and PhD from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Florida. He is currently professor and investigator at the Universidad de Oriente at Valladolid, Yucatán. Uh, he was previously the director and principal investigator of the Office of Community Social Organization in the state of Yucatán Department of Social Development. He also previously served as the Yucatec Director of the International Maya from the Margins Archives and Experiences of History, Identity, and Migration Project sponsored by the American Alliance of Museums of the U.S. Department of State. He additionally served as the Director of the State of Yucatan General Archives and the Director of the Yucatan Office of Conservation of Architectural Historical Heritage. So welcome to the show, Dr. Batun. Hello. All right. And we also have Dr. Kristen Landry Montes. Dr. Kristen Landry Montes received her bachelor's from the University of Northern Colorado. She received master's in both anthropology and art history, as well as a certificate of museum studies from Northern Illinois University and her PhD in art history from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She is currently project facilitator and affiliated researcher with Inherit. Indigenous Heritage Past to Present at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Among other awards, Dr. Landry Montes was a Abraham Lincoln Fellow at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and a Foreign Language and Area Studies Fellow for her coursework in Yucatec Maya. Welcome to the show, Dr. Landry Montes. Thank you, Jessica. All right. <laughs> well, Thank you again, both of you, for, for coming on the show today, all the way from Mexico. And before we get started, I would just be really interested in hearing how both of you got into anthropology and this type of work specifically. So, so what got you interested in this field? My personal, my personal experience as a native Maya is, I mean, how a few was know about the history or the archaeology of the Maya, of my people. So I decided to get into uh, studies and actually use archaeology as a tool uh, to learn more, more about my own past. So I'll go ahead and share a little bit of how I got into the field of both anthropology and then a little bit later art history, although I think those two fields are very related. Um, so when I was little, uh, my my grandparents are actually migrant field workers, and I would go into the fields with my grandpa. He said I thought it was great fun because he would let me. He would cut open these watermelons, and he would just let me put my hands in these watermelons and, and eat all of the flesh from the inside. And I thought it was great. So he would always tell me these stories about Mexico when I was really little, and so I grew up with a great kind of love for the history in Mexico but I never really felt entirely attached to my background. So I, um, when I grew up, as I was growing up, I think like most young kids like to do, I wanted to be a paleontologist. I wanted to dig up dinosaurs. <laughs> and I was always out in the dirt looking for dinosaurs. Um, but I, I always had this love for history that I think developed early on, and especially Latin American history and indigenous history. So I, um, when I went to college, I began taking classes in anthropology and I got my first master's in anthropology and went and worked on archeological excavations. But as it turns out, <laughs> I don't like snakes too much, nor spiders. So I found this whole other field where I could focus specifically on um, things like architecture and art, and it was a better fit for me. So I got a second degree in art history and ended up getting um, my PhD in art history as well. 
Um, but throughout that time, I taught a lot. And so I've always been very interested in education and particularly working with communities I was researching in. So how, for the two of you, how do you, how does that background that both of you have apply to the, the current projects that are, you're doing? So first of all, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you're, you two are doing together? Sure. Well, this project is a collaboration between, um, well, several parties. So a university, uh, the University of North Carolina, and specifically um, the NGO Inherit, Indigenous Lives Past to Present, that's run um, through uh, the University of North Carolina. And we're in collaboration with UNO, La uh, Universidad de Oriente here in Valladolid, Yucatan. And together, we are also collaborating with our students and faculty and invited researchers to work with uh, middle school or what's called secundaria schools here in Yucatan, but roughly the, the middle school level back in the States. And so we're collaborating with teachers and with one another to develop curriculum that focuses on cultural heritage, particularly as it relates to archaeology, history, and the sciences of, of cenotes. Um, so it's, it's very community, community based in that we're working with teachers who are um, who work in the area, but we're also working in nine different communities that are pri primarily Maya as far as um, cultural identification is concerned. Well, I think that my own experience in previous work, I mean, doing archaeology in the Yucatan and working with communities, uh, one of the things I discover is that most of the people living in the uh, modern communities in the Yucatan, they are unaware if the ruins or the uh, vestiges of Maya civilization actually belong to their past. They don't feel this attachment as mm -hmm. saying we are Mayas and the pri previous Mayas do all the archaeological pyramids now you see and the, and the forest that you discover. So what happened is that we have two challenges to protect the either the uh, environmental issues or the archaeological vestiges. And the thing is, make the people aware that this actually belongs to them. It's something we call, we use the name patrimonialization. They have to be aware of their own heritage. And in doing that, we may use archaeology to do that. So we focused this time in cenotes, in how to protect the uh, Maya aquifer. But then we need to make the people actually be aware of the, the cenotes belongs to them. And then, then is when we use archaeology. We use all the cultural background to actually show the people that these cenotes belong to them. Hmm. Being they aware of that, they, they're going to protect us, is what they think. That's the, 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 the premise of the project. Hmm? So, I'm sorry, I'm just really surprised. I didn't realize <laughs> that they, that they um, wouldn't have, like, have uh, recognized that the, the archaeology was connected to them. So I, that really threw me off guard. Yeah, I mean, if you ask, if you ask people sometimes, they they say, uh, who built the ruins? And they say, oh, I mean, somebody else in the past who lived here. But the thing is, nobody say our ancestors. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. They are in some point unaware of that. Hmm. And that's a thing. And um, actually, it's a thing, I mean, I mean, it's not just a, a, a way of thinking is because the uh, Mexican public education have been systematically erasing the past of the Maya. Right. Because we are in a nationalistic country where they teach you you are Mexican, but they are unaware of acknowledged identities. Right. We don't have identities in Mexico as you have in the States. Mm -hmm. In the States, you have to recognize in paperwork your official identity. 
you decide what you are. If you are a Native American, if you are a Latino, if you are an African descendant, or you know, a Caucasian, it's something you desire. Mm -hmm. In Mexico, we don't have that option. We all are Mexicans by law. Right. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you that because that was that was something I was thinking about before we started recording. That in Mexico there was. And this is this is um, just from what I've learned. So obviously, correct me if I'm wrong. But there's this emphasis on basically the fact that, um, as opposed to like in the U.S., where there was more separation, I guess, between the indigenous people and the colonizers, in Mexico it was a lot more. Um, there was a lot more intermarriage. There was a lot more kind of just this mix um and that with the mexican revolution that this was something that was really taken on like and celebrated that this i guess diversity made the mexican people really strong i think that's apparent it's what people i mean in general if you see this from the states you can you gonna see that but you have to go to the uh, deep mexico to the profound mexico uh, and then you're going to see there, yeah, there's a discrimination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. of course. That's what I was going to ask you. Of course, there are. Right. Exist. Mm -hmm. It is. Still, but it's denied. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you, you know, does that, does that match with the reality of, you know, on the ground? Like, obviously, in the U.S., it it's, can be pretty blatant with the, the discrimination. Um, but I was curious, since there is this different focus, whether that was true in in Mexico too. So, and what happened also is that by law, mm -hmm. the Mexican federal government belongs everything. Right, right. So they tell you, I mean, the ruins, the archeological sites, they are not yours. Right. The cenotes, they are not yours. The waters, it is not yours. It belongs to the feds, right. is what they said. Mm -hmm. So basically, they teach you that, they tell you that, they basically disattach you to both your resources and your identity. Mm -hmm. And we have this free education, I mean, at the elementary and middle school, and you know, and they decide what they want to teach us. Right. And then most of the programs are too much uh, nationalistic. Well, I mean, and so let's let's take a U.S. example again. So tribes in the U.S., first of all, in my experience, they're a lot more formally set up than in Mexico, based on my understanding. But also, you know, there's also this uh, experience of education and trying to the U.S. having boarding schools and things like that, where they tried to take away indigenous culture. You know, there was the whole... Um, kill the Indian, save the man saying about boarding schools and the tribes though, there's still, there's still oral history that was passed down. Um, I mean, obviously I don't want to under uh, sell, I guess how destructive that boarding school period was, but there was still kind of a resistance to the education that was being forced on them. And so there is still, you know, there's still oral history that goes against what the government was trying to teach them. Is there still any oral history from the, the Maya communities themselves where maybe they, they share amongst themselves uh, those kinds of connections that they don't publicly acknowledge? Well, the thing is that now... Yeah, it is public acknowledge. I mean, there is a lot of public acknowledge nowadays. Okay. It is. It is. What happened is that there is no legal acknowledge, mm -hmm. and that's the big thing in the states. You legally acknowledge the rights of the tribes. You right. legally, you know, protect the rights on the reservations. In Mexico, we know and we acknowledge we have Mayas, we have Nahuatl, we have Mixtecs, but they are not legally recognized. On my birth certificate, you're never going to see a Maya. You're going to see a Mexican, and that's for everybody. What I've noticed, um, and I haven't been here uh, very long, I, I um, 
although I've done my previous art history research here and, and anthropology research here to extent, this is the longest time I've spent on the ground in Yucatan. I arrived here in May. And what I've noticed, though, in the curriculum that I've seen so far, for example, in the middle schools we're working with, is that there is this sense of, of nationalism that's being taught throughout the curriculum. So students are, are learning about things that are important at the national level. But in these Maya communities, for example, you were talking, Jessica, about oral histories being passed down. There doesn't seem to be any traditions of the curriculum, the current curriculum, the current national curriculum supporting for example, activities about oral histories in these communities. Um, so one, one thing that we are trying to do, one kind of unit that we have for this project is to provide um, young people with materials and information about how to conduct and archive um, oral histories in their own community so that um, they can actually be the interviewers for some of the elderly people in town who have a lot of information to share. That's not necessarily being archived, right? So a lot of that might be lost in the coming years unless um, the curriculum changes, in my opinion. Yeah, right. Christine is, Christine is right in that. I think it's, uh, it's very low, which is very interesting in this project is that some of these local histories are not normally teaching at the schools. So the Mexican system focus on at the national level. I mean, they teach us at middle school the history of revolution, of the Mexican revolution, the Mexican independence. And even when Yucatan don't have a, a real participation on those events. Right, right. But they, it is not in the curricula something about the local history. And right. really, really, I mean, sometimes in general, they may talk a little bit about Yucatan, but not at the local level. So it's amazing when you go and talk with the people around and you ask them about, about some of the uh, main events happening in the area as the colonization or what we know as the Guerra de Castas in the Yucatan, what happened in, in the 19th century. And... I mean, middle school, or high school level, they don't know anything about it. So what we try to do at a level which is very important, which is the middle school, I mean, uh, recover the things about put together some important events on different times happening and related with cenotes and actually try to make them be aware of the importance of cenotes has in the past. Mm -hmm. How important they are in, for the Mayas. They even write things about the cenotes and write up, up, about ceremonies happening in the cenotes at the codices. So teach them the real environment environment around these cenotes and how important they are for the community. I mean, it's not necessary somebody officially tell you your rights to the water. You have to be aware of those rights, even nobody tell you, because it's the water you drink. But as it doesn't belong to the community, it belongs to the nation. I mean, there is a, a, a number, a large number of communities where, where we, we have a cenote in the center of the town, and that cenote is not protected. And when I say it is not protected at this, all the garbage of all the things, I mean, have, coming from around is going straight to the cenote and contaminated. Mm -hmm. mm. And it just happened on the on the eyes of everybody. I mean, we have a number of communities in this project. I mean, we visit where uh, the cenote is exactly on that town, and it's dirty and it's contaminated. Hmm. Right. And people is like not being aware that that's the same waters in the wells where they take the water to drink. There is um. We have one community 
in particular where um, the primary school or the elementary school is built basically right behind uh, a cenote that we're, we're working with, with our middle school students. Um, and the runoff from the, from the elementary school is actually kind of ciphered uh, on purpose <laughs> into the cenote is kind of a, a place where it can drain. So there are these these drains that are actively put in place so that the, the wastewater from the school is running into the cenote. Um, and the days that we were out at the cenote, there were some young boys who had a bag full of something and it was kind of squirming around and I asked them what it was and they're like, oh, these are fish that we have. They caught them in the cenote and they were gonna take them home and eat them. So, um, you know, many of the, many people are still not only just drinking water out of some of these cenotes, but they're bathing in it and they're also eating, um, you know, animals that are coming from cenotes that in some cases are, are being polluted, you know, with out, outright human and animal waste. Okay. Well, we are actually at our first break point, if you can believe that. So I, when we come back, I'd like to... I'm not sure that all of our listeners even know what a cenote is, so maybe we should start there. Yeah, so we'll get into that when we get back in a few moments. This network is listener supported. We're trying to move away from paid advertising while also creating new shows and supporting the ones we have. The APN has never and will never make a serious profit on our podcast. Every little dime we make goes back into the network and improving show quality. So become a member today at www.arcpodnet.com slash members to show your support, get some extras, and be a benefactor for archaeological education. Members get stickers, a coffee mug, a t-shirt, bonus content, early access to episodes, a private Slack team to talk to other members and the hosts, and full access to training on Team Black over at arccert.black. So check out our memberships at www.arcpodnet.com slash members today and support archaeological education. That's www.arcpodnet.com slash members. Now back to the show. All right, and we are back. Okay, so let's dive into what is a cenote and what does it mean to Maya communities? Well, a cenote, I guess, for those of us living in the U.S., the easiest way I can sort of describe it very basically is that it's something similar to a natural underground well or aquifer. And cenotes are, um, they develop because of the karst landscape here. And there's similar features that are also in, you can find them in Florida, for example, um, but the important thing to acknowledge is that they're locations of fresh water and they're in the Yucatan Peninsula, really the only major source of fresh water besides rainfall, historically speaking. And the cenotes are, are connected underground. So they're not um, individual, let's say, underground lakes by any means. They're all connected. You want to um, maybe add a little to that, Ivan? Yeah, just to add a little bit, in, I mean, and people can actually imagine how mm-hmm. all is this. It's good to conceptualize as a, the Maya aquifer because given the karst nature of the Yucatan Peninsula, we don't have surface rivers. It's everything is underground. And all the water and you know, all those beans are connected all over. And sometimes when the uh, ground above collapses, it opens a cenote. And you can have these kind of cenotes which are like, we may name it, uh, open cenotes. And it looks like lakes, like small lakes. Mm -hmm. Then you have this other kind of cenotes, which is very common, which is you have to go underground cave, and then you hit it. And there is this open caves with cenotes around but the thing is that it, all this water is connected so you can see it in the ground as a cave cenote or an open cenote and the maya word ivan for cenote is tona, right yeah actually the the uh the word cenote is an you know spaniard of the word sonot yeah, that is the, the Maya word for these uh, bodies of water. And when you're working with the schools to, to teach about cenotes, 
how do you decide what kind of a focus you're going to teach about? Are you, are you working with the community on that or? Yeah, we actually um, came into the project um, on a proposal that was already written. So the proposal for this project was written um, by Patricia McEnany, who's the principal investigator of the project, and, mm-hmm. and also by um, Gary Vale, who is um, an anthropologist and works uh, prim- primarily with, with codices and was the previous co-director um, with Inherit. We largely adopted uh, the proposal that was approved for National Geographic when we came on the project, um, um, specifically when I came on the project earlier in, in, it was in April. And basically what the proposal focuses on, it has a couple of different areas. So one area um, is oral history and cultural patrimony and other areas also focused on cultural patrimony and archaeology, and another area is focused on um, science and safety of cenotes. So we um, have these basically three major areas that we're working within um, in relationship to the educational activities that we're creating. Okay, so I guess if you could sum it up, what is the main point that you're hoping that the students will take away from these these lessons and these different areas of focus? Well, I can start saying that one of the focus, actually, we try that the middle school children actually learn more about the cenotes. But all this knowledge that it is not teaching at the school, actually the values, the real nature of the cenotes, together with the history of the cenotes, how the Mayas use it, how many horror histories have been developed around the cenotes. Um, when they see, the, the children start seeing this, the importance of the cenotes, they actually start getting aware mm-hmm. of this. They focus their minds into the cenote, which is something that is not happening. So we call their attention to the cenotes and saying, you know, this is rich. This is rich not only for environmental issues. Of course, it is important. We have to be aware of the importance of our aquifer and that we have to protect it. Yeah, but also it's rich in culture knowledge. So it was before very important for our culture. I mean, the ancient Mayas, they know how important were these cenotes, and they preserve it, and they take of care of the cenotes. They use different systems of education, but they protect it because they, the cenotes were important for the ceremonies. Even when they go deep, the, the, the water deep into the cenote, it was called Suhui water or Suhui Ha, which means it's the most sacred. And they have to use this water for important ceremonies. And that's a different way of teaching them how important it is, how secret it is, how many put in the mind of the children different values uh, to really know how worth is the cenote. And I think this is, is really important because at the end, we as science people, you know, we have we are, our real goal is to protect the aquifer which the, the Maya aquifer is one of the most important sources of water in the world. Right. And so what what kind of results have you seen? Like, what has the kids' reactions been? Well, I think that coming from an educator's perspective, which is probably what I can best speak to, I think that this age group was absolutely the right age group to go with because the students are they're just old enough to really be able to grasp a wide range of pretty complex concepts so we can and and diverse concepts so we can teach curriculum about oral histories we began with oral histories so basically the background of of cenotes in the area and how to obtain oral histories and archive them Um, and then we moved on to kind of science and safety so how how are cenotes formed how can we protect them Um, what kinds of animals are in them 
And then um, we've ended kind of with archaeology and, and issues related to cultural patrimony and trying to create a greater sense of agency. That, well, basically that the children, the kids feel they have a, a greater sense of agency and protecting their own, the synergies in their community and their own history, their own sense of my identity. So I think that one thing I've seen with the students is that they begin to kind of take on um, this activeness in their own way. So in one of the schools, they wanted to start a cenote club. So now after hours, they're meeting with one of their teachers to pick up trash around one of the cenotes or to talk to engage with more community members um, about the history of the cenote. So we can see them actively engaging more and more with the communities, um, specifically as that relates to cenotes when we when we go back to the schools. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think we actually, I mean, we in the planning the project, we select this age group. And I mean, we, we of course, we receive advice. And I mean, people say that, uh, educators in Yucatan, they say that this uh, high school, I mean, middle school, the first grade of middle school, which is actually the second grade in, in, in the United States, but in Mexico, that's the first grade of middle school, and that is the better age. They get everything, and not also get it. They start talking about with their families because they go to home and they talk about it. Um, we are very aware because we got we, we, we need all these uh, parents' permit, mm -hmm. and parents were actually also very happy of their children participating, and they seem to know what everything, all the information they get from the children, and it means that we know we not only hit the children with this new knowledge and this new awareness of this notice, but we also hit the parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we just keep seeing more and more as we go back to the schools because we began each of our units. Basically, we went out, did oral history in each of the nine schools, and we would come back and do, for example, science and safety activities and then codices activities a little bit later. So as we were, we were going to certain schools and then coming back to them, we started to see more and more agency in the kids, and sometimes they'd invite their parents over or their other friends and... <laughs> They they all wanted to now take part in all of these activities, um, and even now that the that the uh, project is winding down, um, I still hear from several of the teachers how excited the students are, and they want to do all of these things. And you know, middle school students have a lot of energy, <laughs> so um, I really do agree. I you know I never taught or worked with middle school students before. I taught at university for a long time. But wow, they, yeah, they have a lot of energy and it's just a lot of positive energy with, with this age group. I, I really love it. Mm -hmm. So is there plans for a next step? Yes, we're currently still stepping, I guess. We, uh, we're putting together um, two types of manuals that we're hoping can eventually become integrated into the curriculum because... Um, as, you know, Yvonne and I were discussing earlier, there really doesn't seem to be a lot of focus on the local level at indigenous history here in Yucatan as far as the, the teaching curriculum is concerned at, um, at the level of the secundarias or the middle schools. So um, while students, for example, here in Yucatan, I saw their science textbook and they're learning a lot about earthquakes. Well, there's not really any earthquakes in this region as Yvonne, um, you know, has noted to me before. But the students are given all this information that they're, they're supposed to digest, which is fine. But I noticed that they're not learning anything about the geography or science of this specific area, the importance of cenotes. Right. So we're working with one another um, and with several of our core teachers to actually write a, t a textbook or basically a manual for the teachers with activities and then also a manual for the students with activities, some that we've done and some that the teachers and, and even some of the students have come up with for things that they want to do in the future related to um, some of the themes that we've discussed this year so far. And so we're in the planning stages of this, but we're actually hoping to finish up those books by February and get them printed and distributed to our nine schools. And hopefully um, in the future, in the near future, we can have them integrated into the curriculum in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah. Has there been any talk of, of other ways of maybe incorporating the larger community? You mentioned, you know, the parents' interest and 
and obviously the oral history interviews with elders, but curious if there's any other attempts or interest in in moving outside of the schools and doing other work with the community? Well, I think this is an area that Yvonne could actually speak to quite a bit because Dr. Batun um, and our principal investigator, Trisha McEnany, who helped to write the original grant, they actually have a community museum that they help to support in one of our one of the towns that we're currently working in, in, in Takabo. And so that might be a really excellent context where some of our new curriculum that's related to things like oral history could be, that could be a stage maybe for an oral history night in the community. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Ivan? Yeah, since a few years ago, we start, you know, organizing and planning projects uh, What in what we call that community archaeology. Well, it has two important, I think, two, two things that we are really important in community archaeology. One is, in the community archaeology, we, did, we do. One is actually doing research in within communities, which is something that, I mean, in the Yucatan, we have a number of communities, of towns, who are very ancient, who so actually in the past were important Maya cities during the post-classic or the mm-hmm. classic Maya time. And they are being permanently occupied. I mean, people have been living there since those times, to colonial times, to modern times. And not many archaeological works are developed there because they are, I mean, and the community, they are in backyards. I mean, mm-hmm. And the vestiges of the ruins are in the backyard. Right. And basically, you have you have to do a, a very hard work because you have to go into a community interaction. It's not just an official permit to do archaeology or to excavate a site in the jungle, but it's to work in people's backyards. And then you need the permit of the uh, of the of the owners then it means that you need a lot of interaction. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the other thing on community archaeology is that you have to make the people participate in the project, work with you, inform them, get, I mean, their interpretations of the past and put it together at the end, you know, your scientific uh, interpretations. I mean, go along. As the project go, you go along with the community. But the other important things, I mean, the benefits out, coming out of this research have to stay in the community too. Mm-hmm. And so right. we have been working, we have been doing this work since, I mean, 2011. We started doing work in some communities in the Yucatan. Um, we focus our main project in a little community named Takabo which is about uh, 30 minutes out from, I mean, north from Valladolid. And there we actually get some funding. And most of the, we already did excavation, the preliminary excavation. Then we map all, we got all this interaction in the community. Um, most of the result of our research, I mean, we decided to get some funding and build a community museum. And we put together a community museum with the people from Takabo. Um, I mean, these things they, they want to develop, they have a cenote, they have other uh, important uh, colonial and pre-Hispanic uh, ruins there. And we brought with them an important guy to visit Takabo. And it started developing a kind of a small, you know, tourist project for the local community. And they are very happy in that. So, I mean, we are planning, we are planning now to go to a second stage. I mean, we are continuing excavation, getting more information of one of the history, which is, I mean, an study, because we basically start, we already got the permits, we already had uh, this community happy with the work we're doing, and we're going out for doing more excavation in Takapo. Um, you know, although a lot of my training is in art, art history rather than um, anthropology of this area, I... Uh... 
really have to say as an art historian, I really appreciate the work that um, Dr. Batun and Dr. Uh, Patricia McEnany, the our principal investigator, are doing out in Takabo because so often I see as an art historian who focuses in Indigenous American um, pre-Columbian art history, I see so many objects that are taken or were taken um, from places in the Americas, from Indigenous communities. Um, but, and this is still largely, it still happens today where a lot of these objects end up in um, museums in the United States or museums in large cities in Mexico um, or museums, you know, across the Atlantic. And so few of these communities, several of whose members may actually work on an archaeological excavation to recover these things, so few of these objects actually stay in the communities. And that's always been something that really upset me for a long time. But so I'm really happy with the work that um, Yvonne and Patricia are doing in Takalo. I think it's a great model. I'm sitting here nodding my head. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is a really interesting note to go into break on. I mean, because obviously the natural thing that that makes me think of looking at, you know, the U.S. and Mexico, the, the U.S. has a pretty terrible history with indigenous people. But one thing that I do think the U.S. has done right, or at least like attempting to do right, is NAGPRA or the Native American Graves Protection yeah. or Repatriation Act and the effort to make sure some of those objects do go home. So definitely an interesting note to, to go to break on and everyone think on until we'll be right back. <laughs> Hey, podcast fans and digital archaeologists. Have you heard about WildNote? It's a data collection app that works online or offline on your smartphone or tablet, iOS or Android. It allows you to collect field data easily, manage data efficiently, and generate data reports and site records effortlessly. We have a growing list of state site forms built in for your use and some generic forms that will work anywhere. Check out the shovel testing and photograph forms. You can get a free all-access 30-day trial today by going to wildnoteapp.com. That's wildnoteapp.com for your free 30-day trial. Now back to the show. All right, and we are back. Okay, so during the break, we started talking a little bit more about the community museum. And one aspect that was really interesting to hear about was the Heritage Trail Project that went along with the community museum. So, uh, Dr. Batun, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the, uh, the, commu- the uh, Heritage Trail was actually a project going together with the uh, the museum project in Takabo, because most of the exhibits in the in the, uh, in the museum talk about the history of Takabo. And one of the good things when you have a community muse- museum, you have the things you may want to see, which are actually the, most of the history is told in the museum. But then you want to see the real, the architecture, you have even the the pre-Hispanic Maya architecture we have around Takabo, or the colonial churches, or the colonial uh, ruins of the churches we have around. So we actually create this trail, actually like a tour around Takabo, where you visit all these things that we talk about in the museum, but also you see the uh, environmental features, I mean, meaning the cenotes and the rejolladas, which are the Maya gardens of cultivation. Yeah, and you also mentioned that there was a beekeeping. So basically that there was, uh, and now I'm trying to remember, but in the pre-Columbian era that there was Maya beekeeping efforts in this Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, actually, actually, uh, what which is important to say is that in the Recoyadas, we have these Maya gardens of cultivation, but uh, we're pretty aware that they are probably even we are still looking for the uh, material evidence archaeological evidence of the large production of honey takabo name in maya actually means the place where the honey was stirred is what it means in maya takabo so we have all this information coming from colonial resources that uh, the people from takabo start 
actually taxing these Spaniards with honey, and which actually talk about this uh, the importance of beekeeping in Tacabo. And where, as as we say, we are still looking for the uh, archaeological evidence, working on it, but. Uh, people around the Cabo is still doing beekeeping. So, and they, most of the people still use the traditional ways of beekeeping. And some people is still keeping the, uh, the local the small bees, which are different, are stingless bee called uh, the Maya bee. Huh. Does it taste any different? <laughs> well, taste is, 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 well, taste depends of, uh, of the flowering. Uh-huh. I mean, ta- cap means this is a uh, honey come for a plant named tajonal, ta, which is a very nice uh, yellow, like five petals flowers, which are all around. You can see during the fall. And that's cool because we decided to actually decorate the museum with these mm-hmm. paints of this flower around. That's cool. So how did the people in this community, did they have much of a feeling about archaeology before this museum? Was there previous interactions at all with with archaeologists? And also, I'm, I'm personally curious whether you think that their reaction to archaeology was maybe any different because it's you, you know? That, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you I know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. What what happened is that I mean most of the archaeology in Mexico is done officially by I mean by the federal government through an institution we named the INA I N A H, and they do and this is the official archaeology. And the other kind of archaeology is when foreign investigators came to do archaeology around. And there's two stigmas. Actually, uh, people uh, just say that, I mean, foreign people just come and they investigate, go to the to the field, and they find things and they, they never show us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they even come with these, I mean, local histories about foreign people coming and taking a, like a big golden bell, you know, they found a big golden bell out of the cenote and they took it. And, you know, we know that they, they are only histories. I mean, my, in the past, in the pre-Hispanic time, they don't use gold. I mean, we don't have gold in the Yucatan. It wasn't important for the Mayas in the past. They preferred the jade. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, and the other thing is when the official from the federal government come and do archaeology, as they have to do it when they have these uh, construction, road construction projects, they have to do some, for law, they have to do some rescue archaeology around, I mean, at the edge where these roads are being constructed. And when they did the, the road from Calocmul to Tacabo, which is a 10 kilometers road, uh, they came and they hired local people. They found stuff, you know, like ceramic vessels and obsidians and something. People talk about it like knives, obsidians and things. But they said they took it all. They took it all and nobody knows where they are now. So when we started speaking about doing a community museum and what we found, because we are coming from a local university not too far from Takabo, um, I mean, we locals and we are investigating, we're doing archaeology, but differently because all the things we found are going to stay at the community. And they were really happy and they are happy, I mean, with our findings staying in Takabo. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> that's that's something we hear a lot up here, too, is, you know, on the, the cultural anthropology side, I'm, a, I'm an ethnographer, a cultural anthropologist by training, is... You know, people will go out and work with tribes and they'll do all these interviews with elders and then the tribe itself never sees any of it. Like they never get any of the interviews back. They don't um, have any record of it that it ever happened. So I, yeah, it's, it's, it's that exact same feeling of, hey, wait, you did all this stuff. <laughs> like, we're, we want to see it too. Yeah. So... My next question, I guess, then, I mean, kind of the obvious one is it sounds like 
on on what people can do, not just so based on those experiences, but then also based on your other work that you've seen, what do you think archaeologists could do to be better received in communities? Well, I think, and this is going through what uh, the way I like to the uh, our research at our communities be known in the rest of the world, because I think that archaeologists and people coming from outside to the communities have to be aware that this the people living in the communities they are not like uh, I mean savage people living in the middle of nowhere. People is very smart, and people understand pretty well what's going around. And they read newspaper, they listen to radio, and they very aware of the things happening around. And publicly known, I mean, there is a a way of thinking nowadays. I mean, and is still uh, spread in the Yucatans, uh, saying that. Most of the knowledge, I mean, especially the um, investigators come to the, our, our communities, they took our knowledge, they publish, they get money out of this, and the right. communities right. are still poor. Right. And, I mean, people sometimes, they are different kind of people in the communities, and there is probably a number of people who just be happy with a few pesos in their pockets. I mean, they're happy, they cooperate a little bit. But if you explain them a little better option they have when they have this knowledge, giving them back the knowledge of their history, the cultural resources, the environmental resources, when you make them aware of this, they also, smart people, think that they can also get money out of this in, in you know, legal tourist business. Hmm? Mm-hmm. Or developing, I mean, we also think in a way of actually reincorporate the way of producing honey in the past, and they can do it at the present. And they also may produce more more honey, but also is is a tourist attraction when you see that. And see, well, if you, I mean, the point is, if you get back them the knowledge, they may use that too, mm-hmm. and they also get benefits from what is coming out of research. And that is only published for the entertainment of other people. So Dr. Landry Montes, what about from the education work that you've been doing? What do you think other archaeologists could learn from from that side? I think it's really valuable to work with young people in the community. Um, That's something I've noticed uh, that. And I'm not myself an archaeologist, but um, at this point, but I've been on several projects and I think it would be, and I have colleagues also who work, um, who are archaeologists who work in high schools, and they actually take their young high school kids on excavations. Um, And I think it would be wonderful for more, perhaps more archaeologists to entertain the thought of not only hiring community members from local communities to help do some of the work that in many cases can be grunt work, but to actually um, develop maybe educational programs as part of their proposals for funding that incorporate some of the younger minds in the community so that they can also become stewards in the future. So that they're not only just, people in the community are not only just earning a little bit of money when the archaeologists are in town and then they never see anything again and don't continue to reap the benefits from the work that was done there, but so that young people who are interested and and really anybody who's interested in the community can continue to expand on the knowledge that they receive, perhaps via archaeological training or cultural patrimony training while they're part of these archaeological excavations that are in town. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked first about what you wanted the Maya students to get out of the curriculum. For both of you, what would you want the rest of the world to know about being Maya, about the Yucatec region, about the communities that you're working with? about the archaeology, what, you know, if there was just a couple nuggets that you would like the rest of the world to understand, what would it be? 
I <laughs> desperately want more people to understand that when I say, oh, you know, I teach Maya art or I teach Maya about Maya culture. Uh, the majority of people in the United States think that this is a culture that no longer exists, that somehow ended with the Spanish conquest and that was it. Um, and, you know, there are thousands of of not only Yucatec Maya speakers, but um, there are other dialects in the area um, that are spoken. Um, I don't know the exact number, but it's in the thousands, certainly. So it's a really strong living culture with a very vibrant language. And I wish more people, I guess, in the United States and perhaps abroad knew more about the fact that you know, this is a very strong living culture that has a lot of influence um, in this region and, and beyond. Right. Not the whole like, ooh, the Mayas disappeared thing. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Where did they go? I mean, that, that's the case I noticed. That's just the case I noticed in teaching in the U.S. with so many, when whenever we get to chapters or parts of the curriculum on indigenous American um, art or architecture or culture, it seems like, you know, are still dealing with um, this sense that if, if, if I'm talking about indigenous Americans or Native Americans or the Maya or, or people who are related to the Aztec, that we're dealing with people who no longer exist or who no, who no longer are creating, you know, really important elements of of art, architecture, culture, et cetera. What about you, Dr. Patoon? Yeah, why I know any means in Maya language, we still here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the things, I mean, we still in the Yucatan. And I mean, just in the Yucatan, there is about kind of 200,000 uh, mm -hmm. speakers of Maya language. Hmm? Wow. And I mean, most of the people as of course, the identity was stolen, but I mean, most of the people is aware now. I'm happy to be Maya, and we still have to do some education. Um, we working together. There is a most of the Yucatan people is aware of that and working to uh, actually present how the modern Mayas are, mm -hmm. how they are, how we are. Mm -hmm. Right, and there is not the only way to be Maya. Mm -hmm. There's different ways to be Maya. That's that one of the things also I want the rest of the world knows. I mean, there's different ways to be Maya. There's not just a stereotype Maya. Right, and there are Mayas we are uh, educated. We are Mayas who have uh, many uh, artistic skills. Many uh, Mayas who are good sporters, and I think there's. A lot of different ways to be Maya, but being aware. What about along those lines? Is there a sense of connection between the Maya groups in, like, you know, Mexico and, and Belize and Guatemala? And what is, what is that like? Well, I think there is a connection with not just with the, the people going south from the Yucatan, also with the people going north, mm -hmm. with the people from, from Mexico. That's a, I mean, we have the uh, the same origin. But I think the uh, a personality thing that the Maya at the Yucatan, or the Maya in general, they never consolidate as a single nation. Mm -hmm. Right. So one, that's one of the points missing, I think, on the history, because, you know, the size of the whole entire area was was occupied by the Maya in the past, is about the size of, I mean, all Central Europe. And all Central Europe is divided in different countries. They speak different languages. They are about the same number of people. And so we acknowledge them as Spaniards, Italians, English, French, Germans. But then, I mean, we want to put them, all the Maya that are on the same area as one single thing. Right. And it is not. Right. And it is not. So even in the Yucatan was, uh, when the time when the Spaniards came in the 16th century, it was divided in 19 different chiefdoms. So we want, I would like that world actually acknowledge that diversity too. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Hmm? Right. 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 That makes sense. It's just the Romance language. Probably the Mayan, the different Mayan language have the same root, root as the Romance language has. Right. But we easily acknowledge the difference in t- between an Italian and a French. Mm-hmm. And I think we have to do that with the Maya. We don't put together in the same basket a huge people living in a huge geographic area. Right. Well, on that note, is there anything else that the two of you wanted to add before we close out? I think we're both good with that. There's a lot to say, (laughs) (laughs) but we would be here all night. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot more to say, but I think you guys hit on some really important points. So, yeah, thank you both of you for coming on and, and taking the time to talk to us today. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Jessica, for the time and the opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much. I thank you for the, the opportunity to actually to talk more about these, uh, you know, kind of different ideas of how to we think about the Mayas and the research we're doing, how different it is from prior archaeological work done in the Yucatan. Yeah, it'd be interesting to, to continue the discussion deeper sometime. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Heritage Voices podcast. You can find show notes at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash heritage voices. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or the Google Music Store. Also, if you like the show, please share with your friends or write us a review. If you have any questions, comments, or show suggestions, please reach out to me at jessica at livingheritageanthropology.org or you can find me on Facebook through Living Heritage Anthropology or on Twitter at Living Heritage A. As always, thank you to Lyle Blanqua and Jason Nez for their collaboration on our incredible logo. This show is produced by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.